Hello, and welcome to my group's presentation on the BP oil refinery disaster, Texas City. On March 23, 2005, several explosions and a fire occurred during the startup of the incineration unit at the BP Texas City oil refinery. As a result of the incident, there were 15 fatalities and 170 injuries. As for property damage, numerous vehicles were set on fire and over 50 large chemical storage tanks were damaged. This resulted after a series of events which eventually ended with liquid protruding from the top of the blowdown stack, creating a large flammable vapour cloud which was believed to later be ignited by a diesel pickup truck parked nearby. As said, the end result that caused the explosion was caused by a series of events constructed from numerous failures due to inadequate system and safety measures. It could be said that if any one of these failures had been prevented, it would have been more unlikely that the final blow would have occurred, if at all. The first in the series of events occurred in the Raffinet Splitter Tower. The Raffinet Splitter Tower is used to separate the lighter hydrocarbons that are used to raise the octane levels in gasoline. Hydrocarbons in liquid form are released into the tower and occupy the space at the bottom. They are then heated and the lighter vapours rise to the top of the split tower where they cool and condense. The tower at the BP oil refinery stood at 164 feet though operating guidelines limit the fluid levels at 8 feet. This is to allow for proper distillation and to avoid overpressurizing the tower. However, at approximately 3 a.m. on the morning of the explosion, an alarm had been triggered in the tower to notify operators that the liquid levels in the tower had reached 70% of the bottom 10 feet. Although the operators were aware of this, they continued to feed the tower as they had done before on previous occasions. There was also a second alarm attached to the split tower, which notified when the liquid levels had reached the 9 foot mark. Although on the day, this alarm failed to activate and the levels then surpassed the 10 foot mark. This led to a larger problem, as the tower's level transmitter only measured up to the 10 foot mark meaning beyond this the operators could not ascertain the actual level of the liquid. That, that's it for my part and I will now pass over to my fellow team members who will explain the rest of the case. The BP refinery in Texas City is the third largest refinery in North America producing up to 10 million gallons of gasoline per day. It also produces jet fuel, diesel fuel and chemical feedstocks. The refinery's isomerization unit, or ISOM, is a refining process used to convert low octane blending feeds, primarily pentane and hexane, into higher octane feed for gasoline blending and chemical feedstocks. Within the ISOM unit, the raffinate splitter section is used to split the feed from Aromatics Recovery Unit, or ARU, into light and heavy components. 40% of the feed is recovered as light raffinate and is used as feedstock for the ISOM unit. The remaining heavy raffinate is used for jet fuel, chemical feedstock or gasoline blending. The raffinate splitter section can process up to 45,000 barrels per day of raffinate feed from the ARU. During normal operation, cool raffinate liquid from the ARU is pumped to the raffinate splitter tower's midpoint via a heat exchanger and a reboiler furnace. Heat transfer in the exchanger occurs through contact with the tower's bottoms, the heavy raffinate, which is pumped to the exchanger. The reboiler furnace then uses fuel gas to further heat the feed raffinate and the heavy raffinate. The feed to the tower is controlled via an automatic flow control. Within the 52 metre tower, 70 distillation trays are fitted, assisting in separating the light from the heavy raffinate. The separated heavy raffinate, as previously mentioned, is pumped and circulated through the feed heat exchanger and the reboiler. The side stream leaving the feed heat exchanger flows via water-cooled heat exchanger to heavy raffinate storage. This side stream flow is automatically controlled by the tower level. 
Light raffinate vapours flow overhead and down 45 metre long section of pipe. Three pressure relief valves at the bottom of this pipe section are provided to avoid overpressure in the overhead vapour line. An air cooler further downstream condenses the vapour to liquid, which then flows to the reflux drum. Liquid from the reflux drum is then pumped back to the splitter tower above the top tray. Once again, a side stream system is in place to allow light raffinate to be further cooled via a water-cooled heat exchanger and flow to light rough storage. The reflux drum is operated as a flooded drum with minimal ullage. Drum pressure relief valves are used to remove uncondensables such as nitrogen. The larger drum purge system is typically used during startup of the unit. The liquid and vapour discharge from the four pressure relief valves and manually operated bypass valves is sent to the blowdown drum and stack. Vapour passes through a series of baffles to help condense vapour. Remaining vapour is dispersed through the top of the stack. The liquid in the drum falls to the bottom and a manually operated valve is used to release liquid to the sewer system once the gooseneck seal height is reached. Liquid can also be pumped to the light slop tank. Typically a level, mainly water, is maintained in the drum. The raffinate splitter tower has level monitoring via a sight glass and a level transmitter which is monitored remotely via the control room. A high level alarm is designed to sound when 72% is reached. Another high and low level alarm are fitted but are redundant. The tower level is measured over a 1.5 metre span in the bottom 3 metres of the tower. The blowdown drum also has a level sight glass and a high level alarm programmed to sound just prior to liquid going over the gooseneck seal. During normal operation, minimal personnel would be located within this area and only the permanent catalyst warehouse building is located nearby. During this start-up and operation, however, there were an increased workforce of contractors and extra temporary buildings located within the vicinity due to shutdown work. The accident at the Texas City BP refinery in 2005 did not result from a single point of failure. It was actually a combination of issues that, when combined, developed into a catastrophic disaster. Critical safety equipment had failed, some of which was found to be unsuitable for use in this process. Operators were not following written procedures, although there is historical evidence that this had been happening for many years. There was also a lack of communication between operators. The refinery had developed, through years of operation, a substandard safety culture that was continually putting lives at risk. Looking at the process involved in the accident, we find a level transmitter located at the bottom of the raffinet splitter. This was not designed to measure liquid levels above 3 metres. The tower was some 50 metres high. This provided no insight to the operators of the actual level inside the tower. Adding to the problem was that the transmitter was required to be calibrated to the specific gravity of the liquid it was measuring. This particular transmitter was calibrated for a different process with a different specific gravity. When the temperature and pressure increased inside the tower, the transmitter actually indicated a falling level. There was also a high level alarm switch installed in the tower. This was a hardwired switch in addition to an alarm associated with the transmitter. Investigations show that this switch failed to operate, most likely due to internal damage. The faulty switch had been reported prior to the startup, but was never repaired. A pressure control valve was installed after the reflux drum. This was designed to divert excess pressure leaving the tower to a flare stack located in a different part of the refinery. The failure of this control valve forced the operators to open a manual bypass valve leading to the blowdown drum. A high level alarm was also installed on the blowdown drum. This should have indicated a high level in the drum. The float on this switch was found to have filled with liquid, preventing it from indicating high level. This particular switch was reported as faulty but was never repaired. The design of the blowdown drum meant that it vented vapour to atmosphere through a series of internal baffles. A number of years prior to the accident, the refinery was directed through a series of reports to remove this type of drum and replace it with an inherently safer flare stack system which burnt the vapour. We will now look at some of the human factors involved in the accident. Stress and fatigue play a big part in a person's decision making process. 
Some of the operators had worked more than 30 consecutive shifts of 12 hours or more. This had an adverse effect on their decisions and was largely due to plant-wide budget cuts in the previous years. The budget cuts also affected training and maintenance, which is evident from the numerous failures. Operators had failed to follow safety startup procedures. Valves were left closed and in manual, and there was no communication or handover between shifts, so important process safety information was never passed on. The refinery had a checkered past regarding safety, including 23 fatalities and numerous major incidents in the previous 30 years. Other incidents were ne never examined properly, which bred a negative safety culture throughout the plant. Hi, this is Abdullah. Now, there are three uh, technical improvements uh, recommended uh, by the Department of Health and Safety Executive 2008 UK. First is planned engineering hardware control systems uh, and uh, layout to, to eliminate control and mitigate potential hazards to people and uh, improve productivity are very important. Second, procedures. Uh, many management systems uh, to identify control and mitigate risk and drive continuous potential improvements uh, are need to be considered the capability of our people in terms of uh, leadership skills relevant knowledge and experience and the origin and the organizational culture they create are very important According to the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board 2005, there are three improvements that can be taken into account. Uh, first is safety culture. Uh, C has been issued an urgent uh, safety recommendation uh, to, uh, to the BP Group Executive Board of Directors uh, to examine and BP's corporate safety management system, safety culture, and uh, oversight of, of the North American uh, refineries. They also added 10 recommendations, um, and so which came from um, Baker uh, Panel's uh, report. Um, such as, uh, as uh, effective you know, process safety uh, leadership, developing process safety knowledge and expertise, strengthening management accountability, developing leading and uh, lagging process um, safety performance indicators and monitoring. Second, secondly, you know, trailer sighting. Um, CSB issue, um, uh, uh, issued recommendation uh, uh, to develop the new guideline to ensure that occupied tailors uh, and uh, similar to, uh, temporary structure are placed uh, safely away from hazardous areas of a process plant. Thirdly, the use of uh, blow down drums and stacks that uh, handle flammables. Uh, the CS has been recommended to identify the hazards of this equipment to address the need to adequately size disposable drums and to use the use of inherently safer alternatives such as uh, a player system. There are some useful lessons from this incident. Firstly, the temporary building siting is a critical step in managing flammable or toxic risk. Secondly, atmospheric venting needs a careful design and operation. Moreover, procedures are um, ineffective if they are not up to date and routinely followed. Furthermore, uh, fundamental NASAIP operations uh, is very um, important in terms of, of operations. So leadership, supervision, and workforce are fundamental to SAIP operation. Good engineering practice is important as the BP uh, refineries did not implement good engineering practice. The OSCE scenario was made. 